All right, welcome back to another episode of the All Things AFib podcast. This is your host, Dr. Armin Kiankui. I am absolutely delighted to be speaking with Dr. Patrick McCarthy today. So by way of introduction, Dr. McCarthy is the Executive Director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute and Chief of Cardiac Surgery in the Department of Surgery at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He is the Heller Sachs Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery and also a professor in the McCormick School of Engineering. You know, truthfully, I could spend the next 30 minutes just reading off as many awards and accomplishments. He's co-authored nearly 500 uh, articles. It's needless to say, he's a world-renowned surgeon, uh, not just for his work in atrial fibrillation, but mitral repair as well. And I have to mention that he's developed probably the premier cardiothoracic training program in the country um, and he's really the kind of the, the, the triple threat, if you will. He's a clinical cardiac surgeon, he's a surgeon scientist, and he's a surgeon educator. And finally, I have to mention, you know, over the past three years, he's been working with Dr. Cox and Dr. Bradley Knight and Dr. Susan Kim and Dr. Rod Passman and organizing what I think is really the most cutting edge AFib meeting, the CAST AF meeting that they put on at Northwestern every summer. So... Dr. McCarthy, thank you so much for your time and joining us here today. Thanks, Armin. That was a very kind introduction. Thank you much. Sure. So, you know, I wanted to discuss with you um, the, the article that you were the primary author on. It's in JTCVS. For, so for those listeners, it's in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. It was published in August of 2019, and it's entitled Prevalence of Atrial Fibrillation Before Cardiac Surgery and Factors Associated with Concomitant Ablation. So in your own words, can you just kind of start off by telling us why you felt this study was necessary and kind of what, what drove you to, to do this study? Sure. Well, thanks, Armin. So what we were looking for is, you know, the latest knowledge on how often patients that need heart surgery have atrial fibrillation before the operation. Um, it had become a class one indication, indicating that you should really uh, treat this beforehand. So it's important to know if patients have that or don't have that. Um, and the problem, if you look at that Society of Thoracic Surgeons database, is that they changed the definition of atrial fib before surgery so many times over all the various versions. The earliest version, you had to have it within two weeks uh, before surgery, but it could be that you we're having paroxysmal atrial fib or had been cardioverted a month ago, even though you'd had it for five years, it wouldn't have been picked up. So that was the earliest version. And then it was getting you know, more and more precise. But what we wanted to do with this paper was to focus at the Medicare group and then use their database that is really quite accurate. And so what we looked for was a diagnosis of atrial fib within three years before they underwent heart surgery. So this is a group of patients, therefore, that, you know, you're pretty accurate. You know, possibly they might have written rule out atrial fib uh, um, because they were hospitalized with it and all they would have had monitors, et cetera. So uh, we're pretty confident that um, that group of patients truly did have atrial fibrillation. Right. And so when you think about the papers that existed before, how much AFib do we think was present before we took patients to cardiac surgery? Yeah, so if you look at things like the STS database, they would say maybe that it was only like 15% or something like that that had atrial fibrillation. When we were looking at our own data, then we were finding things like um, you know, 30 to 40%, which was not uncommon. Uh, and therefore, especially like with mitral valve surgery. And so the rates really varied. Um, now, personally at Northwestern, we have atrial fib nurses, like their job is really to talk to patients before surgery. We maintain our database. And so we had any history of atrial fibrillation was picked up. So we didn't always follow just the STS definitions. Sure. And I mean, it, I think it's, it goes without saying that, you know, most centers, most practices, you know, folks who are in cardiac surgery don't have a nurse navigator who's just looking for AFib. So there's, Absolutely. yeah, and so there's, go ahead, please. You're, you're getting so many different pieces of information from the patient at that time that you may forget to ask. And 
I mean, who just does that? If it, if it isn't sort of volunteered, uh, then uh, it may not show up. In the right. Record. Exactly. So we're kind of, we're in this environment where we have class one recommendations, right? Class 1A for mitral valve, class 1B for aortic valve or cabbage. And so let's kind of dive into the paper with that as kind of the, the, the basis, if you will. Like we should be operating on these patients. So let's see what the numbers look like. So, so let me just put a little perspective on that first. A class one indication means for the most part, you really should do this. Like you should have some reason not to do it. Um, and if you think of class one recommendations, like put the left IMA to the LED when you do a coronary bypass, like 99% of the time people do that. It's actually 99 plus uh, percent. Almost always you do that. We fall, uh, fall far short in atrial fibrillation surgery. So what we found overall with all the groups together was about 28% had a history of atrial fib before surgery. So the numbers that we were finding were almost double what the STS database showed. Um, and then what was kind of more shocking was that there wasn't a whole lot of ablation. It was only performed in 22% of patients. Uh, that's a class one recommendation. Now, the sample size was a little bit earlier than the class one recommendation, but it's still, you know, directionally, it indicates that we have a long way to go. Uh, we're not really doing nearly as much ablation as we should be if it's truly a class one recommendation. Right. And just to, to let the, the listeners know as well, you know, when we're talking about class one indications, this is the best data that we have. I mean, these are randomized controlled studies, at least in the mitral valve population. We have large cohort studies for the other um, categories as far as ABR and cabbage. And so, you know, for, for, for the listener out there who's saying, well, what, what is the data? What is the evidence? I mean, this is the best. It's, it's the RCT, right? It's the, it's the standard of care. It's the highest level of evidence we have. And so we have that for mitral valve. And just like you said, you know, for the, for the mitral valve patients, let's get into those numbers a little bit. So 62% of those patients um, had AF or had atrial fibrillation before surgery. And then those who did, only 38% of them underwent a surgical ablation. Yeah, it's pretty stunning, isn't it? So um it really was, I, I was even surprised to see the 60 plus percent of mitral valve patients had atrial fibrillation. In my practice, it's roughly 40 percent, but I do see a lot of very early referrals in asymptomatic patients. But if you look across the country, a lot of the times the atrial fib is the trigger for referring the patient uh, to surgery for mitral valve disease. And so it's what brings it to attention. And so, um, you know, that was higher than what we might have expected. Then the 30%, even though that's relatively high compared to other populations like a coronary artery bypass, um, it's still pretty low. And, uh, you know, there's a disconnect between what we're preaching and what people are actually uh, doing out in the real world. So sure, we sure. need to close that gap. Right. And I think you make a really interesting point when you talk about, you know, maybe the symptoms that the mitral valve patient presents with in clinic, whether it's the AFib, the palpitations, and so then they go on to have a mitral valve repair and surgical ablation. That can be quite different than the coronary patient, right? So we, when right. we often see a coronary patient in clinic, maybe it's for chest pain, maybe it's, you know, for stable angina, and that patient isn't necessarily presenting with our typical symptoms of AFib. And so in your study, you found 20% of the patients with coronary surgery have a preoperative diagnosis of AFib. But in total, if you look at non-mitral valve surgeries, only 16% are getting a surgical ablation. I mean, that's... Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and I think the symptoms are something also that you should be conscious of and aware of. Um, when I see patients and I'm talking to them about their constellation of symptoms or lack thereof, then, um, you know, sometimes they'll mention palpitations and, you know, you question them a little further, is that daily or once a month? And does it last like, you know, 10 seconds or for an hour? And so I have a very low threshold for putting a Zio patch on that group okay. of patients. And so in the clinic, it's down the hall. And so before they leave that day, we put on the Zio and we get two weeks of monitoring. And 
Um, it's not uncommon that we'll detect that they have some uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and they may have been asymptomatic or they may just have occasionally felt some palpitations. Uh, but you do need to kind of be thoughtful about it and aware of it and then to order those monitors as you need it. Right. Yeah, that was definitely a question I was going to bring up. You know, how do we go about screening patients for AFib that either we're taking to surgery or we've been referred that, you know, they may or may not be a surgical candidate, but figuring out whether they have AFib is a, is a really big deal. It'd be expensive, and I don't know that it's truly necessary, uh, but I'll give you an example of a patient two weeks ago. Um, he had a dilated left atrium, mitral valve disease. He's a little older in his late 70s, and, um, but no history of palpitations, no atrial fib documented anywhere, uh, but showed up in the holding area the morning of his surgery in atrial fib. So <laughs> right. he said, well, maybe we should screen every patient that is older and has a dilated left atrium because that's a group that are at risk. But like I said, uh, the cost benefit of that, it's a little bit hard to, to judge. Sure, sure. You know, and, and you talk about that in your paper as well. You know, there were a certain group of patients who were diagnosed essentially on admission for surgery. So it was during that initial surgical admission. And what was surprising is you found that 22% of these patients had what you call infrequent care for their AFib. In other words, essentially their AFib wasn't treated in that three years prior if it wasn't for that admission. Yeah, that's right. There is a fair amount of people that are out there and they have atrial fib and sometimes we see them as surgeons. They've had it for a while. They may not be on anticoagulants. They um, maybe just on rhythm control and if that, um, but, you know, otherwise, quote, it's not bothering them, end quote, okay. and therefore they sort of let them be. But we all know, of course, the risk for stroke is significantly increased for that group. Right, exactly, exactly. So we, we have this situation where, let's say we've, we've identified a patient who has AFib and we're going to the operating room, we're going to do their surgery. You, you identified a couple of populations that specifically, for some reason or another, don't undergo the op operation, and that is you know, the gender being female and patients who have diabetes. Do you think that's because the atria are smaller? Do you think they're sicker patients? Why do you think those two specific groups kind of played out in the data? You know, it's hard to sort out exactly why one group are and others are not treated, and in the absolute difference in numbers there, although it reached statistical significance, wasn't overwhelming. So, you know, consider this just purely speculation that, you know, maybe that group of uh, women were kind of that older, frail patient okay. that you sort of picture. Remember, this is a Medicare population. And so it's not exactly like the STS database that is all age groups. And so we're looking at a group of patients that are inherently a little bit older. So, um, I don't have a good explanation otherwise uh, for that one, because also female uh, sex is a risk for having a stroke. Uh, if you have atrial fib, it's part of the CHADS fast 2 right. And so, you know, that is a group that we should be treating uh, more aggressively. Sure. And the other group kind of in broad terms that we should be treating are the cabbage patients, right? The coronary bypass grafting patients. And you mentioned in your paper, even though they make a smaller percentage of patients who have AFib, the absolute number is Correct. greater. Yeah. So if you look at it, the population was about 80,000 patients, as I recall, and about 60,000 or 55,000 of those operations were coronary bypass. And so 20% of them had atrial fib beforehand and prior reports had mostly been about 10. And so we were finding twice the rate of it, but uh, so 20% versus almost 60%, you know, frequency of atrial fib in the mitral valve population, but there's so many less mitral valve patients that the public health problem is more in absolute terms, absolute numbers, it's the coronary bypass group of patients. And that's the group that uh, we did treat a lot less than we did the uh, mitral valve population. Um, and I think that's just strictly sort of technical how we do ablation. Right, right. So can we, can we talk about that a little more in terms sure. of, um, you know, you, you talk about the fact that, you know, mitral valve surgery lends itself more to AFib treatment just because you're opening the left atrium. We know the lesions that were in there, whereas ABRs and cabbages don't. And so... 
from a practicing surgeon point of view, why do you think surgeons aren't treating it? And you mentioned technically earlier. Yeah, so there have been surveys done over the last sort of 20 years of the population about why surgeons do and do not treat atrial fibrillation. And the number one reason typically is essentially saying it's too complex. Um, if you do a full Cox maze four, um, there's at least 12 applications of sort of the clamp and cryo and things, and it, and it adds a lot of, uh, so that's second reason, it, it adds a lot of cross clamp and bypass time. So again, if that's sort of that frail elderly woman and maybe she has a creatinine at two, you know, judgment may uh, say that, no, you shouldn't treat that. Um, and so I think that that's probably the most common reason that people aren't doing this. Sometimes they just don't um, feel that they've had enough experience or training to be efficient and effective with it as well. Finally, and, and this is decreasing over the years as you look at it, was that people didn't think there was enough data to warrant it, you know, that, well, it wasn't really shown that um, outcomes were better, but that has drifted way down and is almost off the list. So, um, to, point, to that point, for instance, the STS database published that if you are undergoing valve surgery, that surprisingly adding AFib ablation actually decreased the 30-day uh, risk for that group of patients. There are other studies that are looking now at late survival is significantly improved for the group of patients that had AFib ablation versus the ones that were untreated. So those have been multi-center studies and our study uh, from um, uh, from Northwestern. And in addition, we published a paper uh, at Northwestern showing for paroxysmal atrial fib, the same thing held true. So it wasn't just longstanding persistent or persistent, but even the paroxysmal atrial fib patients had reduced survival if you left that AFib untreated. So, and what we also showed is that if you do the ablation, you return the survival to the same as patients who never had atrial fib. So we basically now treat everybody. So we have a, a, a paper that's been, uh, there's in preparation for AATS showing 100% utilization of uh, concomitant AFib ablation with mitral valve surgery. And that's over the last five years. So um, after we did that paper and we showed such a significant survival difference and others have too, um, we just said, well, you have to have a reason not to do it that's pretty convincing. Right, right. I mean, I think for the, for the listener out there who may not be a cardiac surgeon, who may be sending patients, well, whether it's the family practice doc, the internist, the EP, the cardiologist, you know, there's, I think there tends to be this question is, you know, of does it matter if we treat the AFib during surgery? I think earlier you mentioned, well, there's obviously this, you know, managing the left atrial appendage reduces stroke. We now know that from the LAOS-3 study. But just like you said earlier, now we have really good data that speaks to long-term survival, immediate perioperative, you know, decrease in mortality, morbidity. So yes, it does matter. There's a reason to treat the AFib. And I think what you said, and I hope the listeners, I just want to reemphasize this. When you compared a patient population that had AFib that was treated compared to a population of patients who did not have AFib, their survival curves were the same. I mean, I think that says a lot that we can reestablish that normal survival curve in patients who have AFib with an effective surgical ablation. It's almost um, like looking at mitral valve repair versus mitral valve replacement for patients with mitral regurge. If you have a repair, your survival is back to expected for you know age and sex match population. If you have a replacement, it never really gets to that level. It's always reduced. And it appears to us that it's the same uh, with AFib ablation. Once you get rid of it and you treat the left atrial appendage, as you mentioned, decreasing the risk for strokes, <clears throat> which has also been shown, then um, that's going to help the patient's long-term survival. Right. So let's let's talk about your training program for a second. So you're an excellent you know, educator as well. So what are you telling your trainees nowadays as far as an approach for the patient, not, not for the mitral patient, right? So let's, let's, all, let's all say that for the mitral patient, sure. we're gonna open the left atrium. But yep. let's talk about the patient with aortic valve disease or, or coronary disease. What are you teaching your trainees nowadays on, on how to go about surgical ablation? 
So I take a very common sense approach. I'd like to think to patient care. I know that um, I would like to get rid of the atrial fib and I would like to um, reduce their risk for a stroke. Um, on the other hand, I do know that if I do some crazy long complex operation, you know, that may be too much in some patients. So it does take some surgical judgment. So whereas in mitral, we might be 100% in coronary bypass and aortic valve, we may be about 60 to 80%, depending on patient condition. What I do tell them is treat the left atrial appendage. You mentioned the Laos 3 trial earlier. That's quick and easy to do in most patients, unless it's a reoperation. But in that uh, study, they had a significant reduction in late mortality. So kind of the minimum I tell them is try to treat the atrial fib if that is possible. Um, beyond that, um, I look at left atrial approaches different from biatrial approach. And some people are total purists and they buy atrial for everyone or nothing. And, you know, you're crazy if you do less, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do a fair amount of left atrial only uh, approaches just because it's, it can be quick and it can be efficient and it can be very effective. And theoretically, if you had a failure and you wanted to treat the atrial fib, then all you need to do is add the right side ablation later with catheter ablation. And that's pretty quick and easy for the EP guys to add a right side catheter ablation. And so, um, you know, I do a combination of I want to do the best for my patient long term, but also primum non nocere. Um, I don't want to put them at a 30 day risk for a better five year survival. So, I try, you know, to teach them that judgment about when you should and, and when you should do as much as you can and when you should start to be a little more selective. Uh, right, exactly. Right. And so, and I think you've, you've published before that, you know, the difference between a biatrial maze and a left-sided maze, if you will, you know, leaving out those right-sided lesions, you know, right at the time of surgery is maybe about a 10 to 15% overall you know, yeah. difference in, in your rate of, um, of you know, treating the AFib. My atrial definitely has some, mm -hmm. you know, advantages to it. Like you say, it was about a 10% difference, 79%, uh, percent, or, you know, 70 versus 80%. But um, that didn't reach statistical significance. And frankly, the newer operations that we're doing have higher success rates anyways. And mm -hmm. so I think that... Um, that won't necessarily turn out true for us anymore. Right. So let's let's talk about that that newest variation, if you will, for for the listeners out there. Dr. McCarthy, at one point, with him and Dr. Cox, were the only two surgeons performing the cut and sew maze in the U.S. Probably right. And yeah, true. And it makes sense now. Be in the world. In the world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, it it totally makes sense now that you have a variation of the Cox Maze 4 that, um, you know, we've talked about before that seems to be faster and just as um, uh, efficacious. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I always liked the basic tenets of the Cox Maze 3 in terms of that box lesion that separates all four pulmonary veins. Right. We know from the EP literature, that's where a lot of the activity arises. And remember, for us, we give cardioplegia. And so, you know, we start from scratch. So you don't have to worry too much about macro reentrant circuits. You wipe them out with the right. cardioplegia. And then we do the mitral annulus and the coronary sinus. With the new flexible disposable cryoprobes, you can use that to your advantage versus what, what we used to do before. And so, I do uh, the box lesion and the left atrial appendage and the mitral annulus with just two lesions using the long probes. Each one is three minutes. So that's six minutes of freezing. And then I wanna treat the coronary sinus, kind of touch that up just to be sure. Uh, and that's at most an additional two minutes. And so just the ablation is eight minutes. Doesn't take very long. And so that's not adding much to your cross clamp or bypass time. And so, um, again, I've just always worked towards being sort of practical and efficient at doing this and, and yet still maintain the most important um, portions that give you the effectiveness. Uh, but if you really do decrease cross clamp and bypass time um, in that patient with a creatinine at two, you should really improve safety, I would think. 
Sure, sure. And so just just to recap, just to emphasize really everything you just said, you know, for the for the listener out there, Dr. McCarthy is talking about doing essentially the left-sided lesions in eight minutes with cryo. I mean, that's similar to one distal bypass. That's similar to maybe, I don't know, half a valve, you know, stitches. I mean, that is not very much time at all. And so there's really at this point, like Dr. McCarthy was saying earlier, with class one indications, with the ability to do it faster and safer, you know, it, it, to not treat AFib like you had mentioned before is really harming the patient in many situations. Well, and Armin, I'll, I'll add to that too. During that eight minutes, we try to do something else too. So we don't <laughs> okay. just smoke a cigarette for eight minutes. Right. <laughs> so, we, uh, so during that time, you can also be inspecting the mitral valve and you can, you know, you can do steps of the operation that while you're freezing, because once you put the probe on and turn it on, you know, there's nothing to it. And so you look for something else to do during that time to be efficient. Sure. So what, what do you think is kind of the, the case learning curve, if you will? How many cases do you think it, it would take to get someone who's not familiar with surgical ablation? You know, because a lot of times when we're out teaching folks, we're proctoring folks, they're kind of <coughs> learning, they're kind of learning on the job. How many cases yep. do you think it, it takes for a surgeon to get good at AFib surgery? Um, I think about five with the procedure that I just described. Um, the other important part is that we did the drawings from the perspective of the surgeons. And Jim Cox and I have talked about how, if you look at the early May's uh, papers and all, it's written, all the drawings are from the back of the heart. Surgeons don't really look at the heart that way. Sure. So I made sure when we're doing the illustrations that it is if you're standing on the patient's right side, you're in the surgeon's view. And, and I think it's quicker and easier for them to look at it then and then comprehend like, oh, I get it. Here's the box lesion on the mitral annular line, as opposed to if you're looking at a line drawing from the back of the heart and you're trying to figure out what's what, it doesn't come as quickly or as intuitively. Sure. So, I mean, we've, we've kind of touched on a lot of the points on the paper. We've gone over kind of the newest variation of, of what we think can be a very effective, you know, maze or surgical ablation surgery. Is there anything else you think we need to we need to touch on with with regards to these topics before we finish up? No, I, I think that in particular for the group that you just talked about that are just starting out, you know, my trainees and you know others that may not have had a lot of experience with it. You and I have taught classes together and. I'm always a little surprised at how many trainees see, say that they only see one every month or two. Um, I think that they just need to take a little time to learn this. Um, if they haven't had a lot of exposure, there's ways that they can be part of those courses and, and learn how to do this. I will tell you 20 years ago when I was doing the cut and sew maze, it was complicated. It was in fact a pretty, you know, onerous operation. I thought it was great fun, uh, sure. but um, this can be much easier. And so uh, don't shy away because of things like clamp time and it's too complex, I'll never get it. Right, right. Well, I think those are some excellent points and I thank you for sharing those with us. Um, so that'll that'll do it for today. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your time, Dr. McCarthy. And uh, thanks, I, I hope to be able to do this again soon. And uh, thanks for doing this. It's, it's great to get word out. We've needed uh, something like this in the field. This will be helpful. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.